this week on Warriors and Company. I see internet access as the heart of a democratic society. Having a communication system that knits the country together is not just about economic growth, it's about the social fabric of the country. And American culture has never uh, fully come to grips with Vietnam. It's, it's this half-known history. There are these hidden and, and forbidden histories that just haven't been fully engaged. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz, the Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation, the HKH Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. You've heard me before quote one of my mentors, who told his students that news is what people want to keep hidden. Everything else is publicity. That's why two books are rattling the cages of powerful people who would rather you not read them. Here's the first one, Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power in the New Gilded Age by Susan Crawford. Read it and you'll understand why we Americans are paying much more for internet access than people in many other countries and getting much less in return. That despite the fact that our very own academics and engineers working with our very own Defense Department invented the Internet in the first place. Back then, the U.S. was in the catbird seat, poised to lead the world down this astonishing new superhighway of information and innovation. Now, many other countries offer their citizens faster and cheaper access than we do. The faster high-speed access comes through fiber optic lines that transmit data in burst of laser light, but many of us are still hooked up to broadband connections that squeeze digital information through copper wire. We're stuck with this old-fashioned technology because, as Susan Crawford explains, our government has allowed a few giant conglomerates to rig the rules, raise prices, and stifle competition, just like Standard Oil in the first Gilded Age a century ago. In those days, it was muckrakers like Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Steffens rattling the cages and calling for fair play. Today, it's independent thinkers like Susan Crawford. The big telecom industry wishes she would go away, but she's got a lot of people on her side. In fact, if you go to the White House Citizens Petition site, you'll see how fans of captive audience are calling on the president to name Susan Crawford as the next chair of the Federal Communications Commission. Prospect Magazine named her one of the top 10 brains of the digital future. And Susan Crawford served for a time as a special assistant to President Obama for science, technology, and innovation. Right now, she teaches communications law at the Benjamin Cardoza School of Law here in New York City and is a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Susan Crawford, welcome. Thank you so much. Captive audience? Yeah. Who's the captive? Us, all of us. What's happened is that uh, the, these enormous telecommunications companies, Comcast and Time Warner on the wired side, Verizon and AT&T on the wireless side, have divided up markets, put themselves in a position where they're subject to no competition and no oversight from any regulatory authority, and they're charging us a lot for internet access and giving us second class access. This is a lot like the electrification story from the beginning of the 20th century. Initially, Electricity was viewed as a luxury. So when FDR came in, 90% of farmers didn't have electricity in America. At the same time, the kids in New York City were playing with electric toys. And FDR understood how important it was for people all over America to have the dignity and self-respect and sort of cultural and social and economic connection of an electrical outlet in their home. So he made sure 
to take on the special interests that were controlling electricity then, who had divided up markets and consolidated just the way Internet guys have today. He made sure that we made this something that every American had. But we are a long way from FDR, the New Deal, and, and those early attitudes toward industry. What makes you think that's relevant now when you come to the Internet? You know, this is an issue about which people have a lot of passion because it touches them in their daily lives. The Wall Street Journal on the front page had an article about kids needing to go to McDonald's to do their homework because they don't have an internet connection at home. Parents around the country know that their kids can't get an adequate education without internet access. You can't apply for a job these days without going online. You can't get access to government benefits adequately. You can't start a business. This feels to 300 million Americans like a utility, like something that's just essential for life. And the issue of how it's controlled and how expensive it is and how few Americans actually sign up for it is not really on the radar screen. You describe this, frankly, as a, as a, as a crisis in communication with similarity, you say, to the banking crisis and global warming. What makes it a crisis? It's a crisis for us because we're not quite aware of the rest of the world. Americans tend to think of themselves as just exceptional. And we're well, being left- we did left invent the internet, didn't we? We did, but that was generation one. Generation two, we're being left far behind. And so all the new things that are going on in the world, America won't be part of that unless we are able to communicate. So there's a darkness descending because of this expensive and relatively slow internet access in America. We're also leaving behind a third of Americans. A Is third it, you of call us. It the, in here you call it the digital divide? Describe that to me. Well, here's the problem. For 19 million Americans, many in rural areas, you can't get access to a high-speed connection at any price. It's just not there. For a third of Americans, they don't subscribe, often because it's too expensive. So the rich are getting gouged. The poor are very often left out. And this means that we're creating, yet again, to Americas and deepening inequality through this communications inequality. So is this why, according to numbers released by the Department of Commerce, only four out of 10 households with annual household incomes below $25,000 reported having wired internet access at home compared with 93% of households with incomes exceeding $100,000. These companies are not providing cheap enough access to the poor folks in this country? These are good American companies. Their profit yeah. motives, though, don't line up with our social needs to make sure that everybody gets access. They're not in the business of making sure that everybody has reasonably priced internet access. That's how a utility functions. Mm. That's the way we need to treat this commodity. They're in the business right now of finding rich neighborhoods and harvesting, just making more and more money from the same number of people. They're doing really well at that. Comcast is now a hundred billion dollar company. They're bigger than uh, McDonald's. They're bigger than Home Depot. But they're not providing this deep social need of con connection uh, that uh, every other country is taking seriously. And, and you make the point that the United States itself is beginning to experience this digital divide in the world. It's fair to say that the U.S. at the best is in the middle of the pack when it comes to both the speed and cost of high-speed internet access connections. So in Hong Kong right now, you can get a 500 megabit symmetric connection that's unimaginably fast from our standpoint for about 25 bucks a month. For in Seoul, for $30, you get three choices of different providers of fiber in your apartment. And they, they come in and install in a day because competition is so fierce. In New York City, there's only one choice, and it's 200 bucks a month for a similar service. And you can't get that kind of fiber connection outside of New York City in many parts of the country. Verizon's only serving about 10% of Americans. So let's talk about the wireless side for a moment, you know, the separate marketplace that people use for mobility. In Europe, you can get unlimited texting and voice calls and data for about $30 a month. Similar service from Verizon costs $90 a month. That's a huge difference. Why is there such a disparity there? The difference in all of these areas is competition and government policy. It's not magical. Without the intervention of the government, 
there's no reason for these guys to charge us anything reasonable or to make sure that everybody has services. How do you explain that in the course of one generation, from the invention of the internet in this country, to falling way behind, as you say, the rest of the world in our access to internet? How did that happen? Beginning in the early 2000s, we believed that the magic of the market would provide internet access to all Americans, that the cable guys would compete with the phone guys who would compete with wireless, and that somehow all of this ferment would make sure that we kept up with the rest of the world. Those assumptions turned out not to be true. It's much cheaper to upgrade a cable connection than it is to, up to dig up a copper phone line and replace it with fiber. So the cable guys who had these franchises in many, most American cities, they are in place with a status quo network that 94% of new subscriptions are going to. Everybody's signing up with their local cable incumbent. There is not competition for 80% of Americans. They don't have a choice for a truly high-speed connection. It's just the local cable guy. Competition has just vanished. Well, the, the 1996 Telecommunications Act was supposed to promote competition and therefore protect the consumer by bring, bringing prices down. That didn't happen. That didn't happen because it's so much cheaper to upgrade the cable line than it is to dig up the copper and replace it with fiber. The competition evaporated because Wall Street said to the phone companies, don't do this, don't be in this business. So you may think of Verizon and AT&T as wired phone companies. They're not. They've gone into an entirely separate market, which is wireless. They're the monsters on the wireless side. They control two-thirds of that market. So there's been a division. Cable takes wired. Verizon and AT&T take wireless. They're actually cooperating. There's a federally blessed non-compete in the form of a joint, mar joint marketing agreement between Comcast and Verizon. And so the world is perfect for them. Not so great for consumers who are paying more than other people in the rest of the world for slower service. Since the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which I thought was going to lower the price of our monthly mm -hmm. cable bill, it's, it's almost doubled. Well, that's because Time Warner controls Manhattan. There's no competition. The, the cable guys long ago, something they called the summer of love, divided up the systems. summer of love. Yeah, they clustered their operations. It makes sense from their standpoint. You take San Francisco, I'll take Sacramento, you take Chicago, I'll take Boston. And so Comcast and Time Warner are these giants that never enter each other's territories. I mean, you talk to certain people and they say, look, I, I don't know what this is about. I have all the gizmos I want. I have a smartphone, I have a tablet. And they say, what's the crisis? Because I have more access than I can use. There are a lot of bright, shiny objects that are confusing people about the underlying market dynamics here. What people don't realize is that for this wireless access, you're paying too much and the coverage is too spotty. On the wired side, that's where we're really being left behind. And here's the important tie to understand. A wireless connection is just the last 50 feet of a wire. So fiber policy is really wireless policy. Well, these two things fit together. And if the whole country did an upgrade to cheap fiber everywhere, we'd get better con connection for everybody. Right now, though, if a mayor wants to do this for himself, he'll be pummeled by the incumbents. In almost 20 states in America, it's either illegal or very difficult for municipalities to make this decision for themselves. In North Carolina a couple of years ago, lobbyists for Time Warner persuaded the state legislature to make it almost impossible, virtually impossible, to, for municipalities to get their own utility, right? That's exactly right. And so now North Carolina, after being beaten up by the incumbents, is at the, near the bottom of broadband rankings for the United States. And what's the practical consequence of that? All those students in North Carolina, all those businesses that otherwise would be forming, they don't have adequate connections in their towns to allow this to happen. They've got they're subject to higher and higher pricing. They're being gouged. Your book did underscore for me why this is so important to democracy, to the functioning of our political system, to our role as, 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 as self-governing free people. Talk about that a moment. Why do you see this so urgently in terms of our practically dysfunctional democracy today? We need to be able to speak to each other effectively and effectively to government. We need to empower our citizens to feel dignified and ready to cope in the 21st century. 
Having a communication system that knits the country together is not just about economic growth, it's about the social fabric of the country. And a country that feels as if it can move together and trusts each other is one that is more democratic. As a matter of national policy, we have forced other countries to talk about the importance of internet access. Foreign policy, we're great at saying, make sure internet is everywhere. Domestically, for some reason, we haven't done so well. So I see internet access as the heart of a democratic society. You use the merger of Comcast and NBC Universal as the window in your book into what this power can do to the aspirations of a democratic uh, internet. Federal regulators today approved the purchase by Comcast of a majority stake in NBC Universal from General Electric. This merger will create a $30 billion media company with cable, broadcast, internet, motion picture, and theme park components. The deal is expected to close by the end of the month. Uh, you say that the merger between Comcast and NBC Universal represented a new, frightening moment in U.S. regulatory history. How so? Comcast is not only the nation's largest broadband distributor with tens of millions of customers, it also now owns and controls one of the four media conglomerates in America, NBC Universal. That means that it has a built-in interest in making sure that it shapes discourse, controls programming, all in the service of its own profit-making machine. As both a distributor and a content provider, it's in its interest to make sure that um, it can always charge more for a discourse we would think isn't controlled by anybody. So it's a tremendous risk to the country that we have this one actor who has no interest in the free flow of information controlling so much of high-speed internet access. You say the merger created the largest vertically integrated distributor of information in the country. So What's the practical consequence of Comcast having this control over uh, its content? Here's the consequence. Comcast, with the control over its programming and also because it works so closely with the very concentrated programming industry, can raise the costs of any rival coming in to provide, let's say, competitive fiber access. So Google in Kansas City is having real trouble getting access to sports content because Time Warner Cable the local monopoly player there, controls that sports content. So Google, or any other competitive fiber provider, has to enter two markets at once. One market to provide the transport, the fiber, and then also the programming market. And making programming more expensive is yet another barrier to entry, and Comcast can carry that out now. So what should the FCC do about that? This is a moment when we have to separate out content from conduit. It should not be possible for a local cable actor or any distributor to withhold programming based on volume. That's what's going on. The programmers say, we'll sell to Comcast cheaply because they're big, but if you're an upstart, we're gonna charge you three to four times what Comcast is paying for the same programming. That should not be legal. Everybody should get access to the same stuff at the same price, and they should be announced prices. What about the argument that in this modern world, there are certain industries, certain markets, that, um, that require an economy of scale. Critics have said that you're ignoring the sophisticated economics that govern these industries. The economics of these networks did not change when we added a little bit of digital pixie dust to them. It's still very expensive to build these networks. Private actors still don't have an interest in covering everybody because that's too much of an economic risk for them. The better route is sensible oversight. We can learn from our mistakes in the past when it came to regulatory regimes that didn't work, but a regulatory regime is needed without question to make this work for all Americans. I have to say, this is pretty strong stuff. Listen to yourself. Instead of ensuring that everyone in America can compete in a global economy, instead of narrowing the divide between rich and poor, instead of supporting competitive free markets for American inventions that use information, Instead, that is, of ensuring that America will lead the world in the information age, U.S. politicians have chosen to keep Comcast and its fellow giants happy. 
For the last 30 years, the rhetoric of the market being the thing we all aspire to has, in a sense, become the collective vision in America. Our politicians aren't separate from that kind of understanding. I think they believe that it's better to have government stay out of industry. In this particular place, no government intervention is actually a disaster for the country because we leave so many people behind, we subject ourselves to the informational control of just a few giants. The problem for the politicians is that there's no upside right now to fighting back. If they do, they'll lose their campaign contributions. We need to get the public interested in this so that politicians will understand that they're not acting alone. In your last chapter, you describe what has happened in Lafayette, Louisiana, when the city decided it wanted the very kind of internet access you're talking about. And a few years ago, my colleagues and I did a documentary called Net at Risk, in which we looked at the threat to internet access, and we went to Lafayette, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, they're doing exactly what you're describing in your book. We have an out-migration problem with our young people from Louisiana, and uh, I felt it was time for politicians to quit talking and do something. Something like building every home and business in town its own fiber optic connection to the information superhighway. We see uh, telecommunications in the way of internet, in the way of fiber connectivity, as something that should be available to everyone. Just like water, sewer, electricity, telephone. I mean, it all falls into that same lump. I think this is a tremendous um, opportunity for small business and to attract business here. So what the city decided to do was build its own fiber network through its municipal power and water company, Lafayette Utility Systems, or LUS. How did they get away with it in Lafayette when, as you say, they didn't in North Carolina? Persistence of a mayor who very much focused on this and said, we're going to get this done. And there wasn't a statute at that point at the state level making it illegal. Municipalities have a lot of assets at their disposal. They control the rights of way, the access to their streets and their poles that people need in order to build these networks. They can condition access to those rights of way on a particular network being built. Stockholm did this. They say, look, you can come in and build a fiber network as long as it's a wholesale, non-discriminatory, really fast fiber network con connecting our hospitals and schools and police departments. And then you have to let anybody else connect to it. Not that hard. You just draft that, an RFP, request for proposals, and the city can do that using its control over its rights of way. Cities often also have access to this long-term, low-rate financing. They can put their good name behind a bond issue and make sure that it gets paid back by the subscriptions to the network over time. It's a great investment for the city, and that's what Lafayette found out. So how is the consumer in Lafayette situated differently from me here in Manhattan with one cable service? In comparison to where you are in Manhattan, where there's no government intervention at all, in Lafayette, the municipality is acting as a steward, standing up for you. It is, in fact, government's role to stand up against the ethic that might makes right. In most of America, there is no government actor keeping these bullies from charging us whatever they want. Yeah, you describe something in your book, quote, the constant, easy, friendly flow between government and industry in the communications world centered around Washington, D.C. Describe that world. It's a warm pond of familiarity. Everybody knows everybody else. They're all very nice people. You'd like to have a drink with them. They go from a job inside the regulator to a job in industry to a job on the Hill. One easy flow, nice people. Outsiders have no impact on this particular world, and it's would be, I, I talked to a cable representative not long ago about the need to change this regulatory state of affairs, and she looked at me and said, but that would be so disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right. It would be disruptive. Well, you know, the FCC was supposed to be the cop on the beat of the communications yeah. world. But, for example, Michael Powell, who served as FCC chairman for four years in the mid-2000s, is now the cable and telecom industry's top D.C. lobbyist. Meredith Atwell Baker, who was one of the FCC commissioners who approved Comcast merger with NBC Universal, left the agency four months later to join Comcast as a highly paid lobbyist. That move infuriated media groups. 
But that warm pond of familiarity in Washington sees this as absolutely normal behavior. Just yesterday, the former chief of staff of the FCC left to be the general counsel of a regulated company. It, it happens all the time. And so in order to change this, you'd have to make regulation of this area not be carried out by such a focused agency. Right now, the FCC's asymmetry of information is striking. They only talk to the industry. The community is all so close. In order to break that up, you'd have to make sure you had a broad-based agency seeing lots of different industries. About the time I was reading your book, I also read a speech by the present chair of the FCC, Julius Janikowski. He said, the United States is in a global bandwidth race. Our nation's future economic security is tied to frictionless and speedy access to information. If you were chair of the FCC, what would you do to move us forward? I know that it's important to let these municipalities make decisions for themselves. That's going to take a bill in Congress preempting the terrible state laws like the one that happened in North Carolina. We need to make self-determination possible for cities. And the second one is making sure that there's low costs, low rate financing available to build these networks. That's the stumbling block, making sure that you could actually build without needing to put up all the money yourself. Because it pays out over time. It pays out as a social investment for the country. And then finally, changing all those rules at the FCC that are getting in the way of progress. So briefly describe the need. All Americans need a fast, cheap connection to the Internet. And the problem? A few companies control access in America, and it's not in their interest to bring that fast, cheap access to us all. And the solution? The solution is for people to care about this issue, ask hard questions at every debate, make sure you elect people who will act, and give your mayor air cover so that he or she can act to make sure that your city has this fast, competitive access. The book is Captive Audience, the Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power in the Gilded Age. Susan Crawford, I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for being with me. Thank you so much. Just like Susan Crawford, my next guest has been driven to tell a story the powers that be would rather we forget. He found it by chance in documents buried deep in the recesses of the National Archives in our nation's capital. The discovery led him on a journey of 12 years that is now concluded with this beautifully written account of ugly horrors. Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam by Nick Terse. As all of us know, there have been many memorable accounts of the terrible things done in Vietnam, memoirs, histories, documentaries, and movies. But Nick Terse, has given us a fresh, holistic work that stands alone for its blending of history and journalism for the integrity of research brought to life through the diligence of first-person interviews. Those interviews skillfully unlock the memories of American warriors and expose the wounds that, to this day, scar the hearts and minds of villagers who survived the scorched earth of Vietnam. Here is a powerful message for us today, a reminder of what war really costs. Ironically, Nick Terse wasn't even around as the Vietnam War raged. He was born in 1975, the year it ended. Not until 25 years later, while pursuing his Ph.D. in sociomedical sciences, did he discover the secret trove of documents that sent him on this long search. In addition to two earlier books and countless articles and essays, Nick Terse is managing editor of TomDispatch.com the indispensable website if you want the news powerful people would prefer to keep hidden. Nick Terse, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Of the more than 30,000 nonfiction books that have been published since the end of the war, this is one of the toughest. How did you come to write it? You weren't even born until the year the war ended in 1975. I really stumbled upon this project. Uh, I was a, a graduate student when I began it. I was working on a project on post-traumatic stress disorder among U.S. Vietnam veterans. And I would go down to the National Archives just outside of D.C. And uh, I was looking for hard data to match up with uh, you know, self-report material, what veterans told us about their service. And on one of these trips, I was down there for about two weeks. And about every, uh, every research avenue that I, I pursued was a dead end. 
And I finally went to, uh, to an archivist that I worked with there. And I said to him, I, I can't go back to my boss empty-handed. I need something, at least a lead. And he you know, said a few words to me that really changed my life. He said, do you think that uh, witnessing war crimes could cause post-traumatic stress? And I said, you know, that's an excellent hypothesis. Uh, what do you have on war crimes? And within an hour, I was, uh, I was going through a collection of boxes, uh, thousands and thousands of pages of documents. Uh, to call it a, you know, information treasure trove is the wrong phrase. It was a, uh, a horror trove. Hmm. These were uh, reports of massacres, murders, mutilation, torture. Uh, and these were uh, investigations that were carried out by the U.S. military during the war. Uh, a collection of documents called the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group Collection. And this was, um, this was a, a task force that was set up uh, in the Pentagon, and it was designed to track war crimes cases uh, in the wake of the exposure of the My Lai Massacre. Where 500 men, women, and children were murdered by American GIs. That's right. Uh, the military, uh, basically what they wanted to do was make sure they were never caught flat-footed again by an atrocity scandal. So in the Army Chief of Staff's office, there were a number of, uh, of Army colonels who worked to track all war crimes allegations that, uh, that bubbled up into the media, that, uh, that GIs and recently returned veterans were uh, making public. And uh, they tracked all of these, and whenever they could, they tried to tamp down these allegations. Your book is very important to me. I was there at the White House in the 1960s when President Johnson escalated the war. My own great regret is that I didn't see the truth of the war in time. Uh, didn't see what was happening there. And yet, as I said, you didn't even come to the experience until after it was all over, and yet you have become obsessed with telling this story. You had no money, you had no advance, you, didn't have, you had no means of support when you left graduate school to, to do this. I thought that this story was, uh, I, I really thought it was just too important. You know, I could never get those records out of my head. And, you know, then I, I went, uh, you know, I traveled the country, I, I spoke to a lot of uh, American witnesses and, and you perpetrators. Would, yeah. There uh, are 80 pages of notes in here, tiny little notes. You, you seem almost, determined that nobody would accuse you of not having sourced the information. Well, I, I, I know that this isn't, uh, it's not a popular narrative of the war, and, uh, you know, it, it's not, uh, they're, they're hard truths, and, and I know it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are, are predisposed to, to disbelieve this. It is, in, in many cases, it's, it's, it's shocking and it's, it's hard to believe. This isn't, uh, this isn't the, the type of warfare that most Americans think that, uh, that their fellow Americans uh, pursue. But, um, so I, I wanted to make sure that it was uh, documented as, as meticulously as I could. And this is the story uh, of Vietnam veterans told by Vietnam veterans. I used uh, you know, hundreds of, of sworn uh, statements, sworn testimony uh, that, that uh, active duty GIs and recently returned veterans gave to Army criminal investigators. So it's, it's the veterans in their own words. Let me play for you what John Kerry said back in 1971 when he returned from Vietnam and he joined with other Vietnam veterans to talk about uh, the kind of war they had experienced. Here's what he said. Not isolated incidents, but crimes committed on a day-to-day -day basis with a full awareness of officers at all levels of command. It's impossible to describe to you the feelings of the men who are reliving their experiences in Vietnam. But they did. They relived the absolute horror of what this country, in a sense, made them do. Uh, they told the stories of times that they had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires from portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan, shot cattle and dogs for fun, poisoned food stocks, and generally ravaged the countryside of South Vietnam. All these years later, this book you've been working on for 10 years, based upon these documents buried at the National Archives, confirm what John Kerry was saying then. Yes, uh, all the atrocities that Kerry mentions by name there. Uh, I, I found evidence of, of all of those uh, 
those types of crimes represented in the, the records of this Vietnam War Crimes Working Group in the, the government's own files. So at the same time that, um, you know, that, that uh, Kerry and, and the veterans that, that he uh, was referring to there were, were being smeared as, uh, as fake veterans or as liars, the military had all these records that, that proved that these were just the, the, the very crimes that were going on in Vietnam. And the military had these records in 2004 when John Kerry was being swift voted. That's right. Uh, you know, the, these records uh, existed then. There was proof at the time that the military, uh, they knew about it and they, they didn't disclose it to the public. And it was still, you know, under wraps when he was running. I mean, the, the military definitely didn't want these records out there. I, I talked to uh, several members of, of this Vietnam War Crimes Working Group, this Pentagon Task Force. And I asked one of the, the colonels who he ended up retiring as a, as a general. Uh, and he said that at the time he thought it was right, that these records uh, need to be kept secret. It was for the good of the country, for the good of the war effort. But in the years since, he recognized that, uh, that he thought it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, I talked to him during the Iraq War, and he said, you know, perhaps if these things had been aired at the time, if we had been honest with the American people and open with these records, then maybe we wouldn't have had uh, Abu Ghraib, uh, you know, the, the, the torture scandal there. He, um, he, he came to see it as a, as a real failing on his part. What kind of reception did you get when you went out to call on these veterans who had been there, whose testimony was included in these secret files, and who, who must have been disturbed when this young reporter calls and said, I'd like to talk to you about war crimes in Vietnam? There were times when I had a, a door slammed shut in my face or or the phone slammed down on the receiver. Uh, but, but most of the time, uh, veterans were willing to talk. And a lot of them told me that they were, they were happy to, uh, to talk about it in some ways. Even if we were talking about you know, horrific events, uh, you know, a lot of them said that they, they couldn't tell their families about this. You know, it's not something they were able to talk about. But I, but I knew something of their experience, and they were, they were willing to, uh, to walk that road with me. There's a medic. Jamie Henry, who seems to epitomize the stories of everyone else with whom you've talked. Tell me about Jamie Henry. Yeah, Jamie had a, a, a tremendous impact on my life. And, uh, you know, Jamie was, uh, I, I found him through this, this uh, collection of records to begin with. And then I sought him out. And Jamie was drafted and uh, he became a medic and a, and a very good one. The men who served with him said that, uh, that he was, he was uh, among the, the best soldiers that they'd served with. He saved a lot of American lives, and they, they really lauded his performance in the field. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but Jamie saw things in Vietnam that really disturbed him. Uh, he told me that on his first day in the field, he watched as the point man, the, the lead man of his patrol, stopped a young girl on a, on a trail and molested her uh, right there. And, you know, Jamie said to himself, you know, my God, what, what's going on here? And over the next uh, several months, he just saw a litany of atrocities take place. He watched uh, a, a young boy who was just uh, you know, detained and beaten and, and shot dead for, for no reason, uh, an old man who was used for target practice, a prisoner who was beaten up and then thrown off a cliff, uh, another man who was taken and, and held down to be run over by an armored personnel carrier, basically a small tank. And, and Jamie saw these things. And, uh, when he first spoke up about brutality, uh, his life was threatened by fellow unit members. And even his friends came to him and said, look, you have to keep your mouth shut or you're going to get shot in the back during a firefight and no one's going to be the wiser. So Jamie did keep his mouth shut, but he kept his eyes open and he kept cataloging everything he saw. And this culminated in, uh, it was February 8th, 1968, and his, uh, his unit moved into a small hamlet. And his, uh, his commanding officer, a West Point trained captain, uh, uh, ordered all the civilians there rounded up. It was about 19 civilians, women and children. And Jamie was taking a break, smoking a cigarette, and over the radio he heard this captain give an order, and it was to kill anything that moves. And Jamie heard this, and he jumped up, and he went to go try and intervene. But he was just seconds late. He showed up just as five men arrayed around these civilians opened up on full automatic with their M16 rifles and shot them all dead. And Jamie told me that, uh, that 30 seconds after this took place, he vowed that he would make this public. 
and, uh, and, and he made it you know, his, his duty to do so. As soon as he got home from Vietnam, he sought out an Army lawyer, and he told him everything he saw. And this Army lawyer told him that he needed to, to keep quiet because there were a million ways that the Army could make him disappear. He went and spoke to an Army criminal investigator, but, uh, but that man threatened him. He went and sought out a civilian lawyer who told him to get some political backing. He wrote to two congressmen. Neither of them returned his letters. Uh, then he started speaking out. He went on the radio. He went to public forums and even the, uh, the Winter Soldier uh, investigation. He spoke out there, but he could never get any traction. And finally, you know, it was years later that Jamie just gave up and uh, you know, he decided that uh, he just had to move on with his life. Until you tracked him down. I showed up on his doorstep with several phone book sized stacks of documents. And this was the first time that, that Jamie knew the Army had investigated uh, his allegations, had corroborated everything he said. And in fact, uh, the documents even painted a, a grimmer picture than, than Jamie had told because other members of his unit finally spoke up and they talked about things that, that Jamie hadn't seen, uh, you know, additional atrocities. So this is where you got the title for your book, Kill Anything That Moves? That's what he overheard? Yes, this, this, was, uh, this was the order that his commanding officer, the, the West Point trained captain, gave. And, and this was the first time that I really took note of the phrase. But then, as I, I continued you know, working on this topic, I noticed it coming up again and again. I realized that this was the order that was given out by, by Captain Medina, the commanding officer, right. who, uh, uh, to the troops who carried out the My Lai massacre. That was his order to them, to kill anything that moves. And I found it listed in, a, uh, in, in court martial documents from a, a Marine Corps massacre that took place in 1967. And it seemed that everywhere I looked, there were variations on it. Shoot anything that moves. Kill anything that breathes. And I came to see it as, as really a shorthand for, for the war. Do you think this will strike some people as old news? Well, I, I think that uh, in some ways, uh, the, the story of atrocities in Vietnam is kind of a, a half-known history. People have, you know, maybe some inkling of it. They, they know a little bit about My Lai, or they, they've seen glimpses of, uh, of civilian suffering in Apocalypse Now or Platoon or Casualties of War, these movies. But, uh, but uh, I, I, th I think that, you know, the, this society and, and the American culture has never uh, fully come to grips with Vietnam. It's, it's this half-known history. There are these hidden and, and forbidden histories that just haven't been fully engaged. So while I think people might know a little bit of it, I, I doubt that they, they know the, the full story as, as I came to know it. It's not just a litany of atrocities you reach some very significant conclusions about the way the war was fought, how it was not just a, some bad apples that were conducting these brutal acts, but that it was a pattern which was inevitable given the pressures from the top. That's really exactly what I found. When I, when I looked, you know, I, I, I talk about uh, individual micro-level atrocities, things like murders and massacres, uh, and they, they do punctuate the book, but really I'm telling the story of civilian suffering. And, it, uh, and, and the, the sheer number of Vietnamese who were killed or, or wounded in Vietnam or became refugees, uh, this wasn't due to you know, simply bad apples, simply uh, troops on the ground. It was command level policies. Things like the use of uh, unrestrained bombing and artillery shelling on heavily populated areas of the countryside. Uh, policies that were promulgated at the highest levels of the U.S. military. Uh, this is what made it inevitable that there would be this much civilian suffering. That there would be, you know, an estimated two million Vietnamese civilians killed. I mean, the, the, the Vietnam War in Vietnam took such a, a tremendous toll. It's, it's almost, uh, as, as I came to understand, it was almost unfathomable. Uh, suffering uh, on the part of the Vietnamese people. Um, you know, the, the best estimates that we have are, are 3.8 million Vietnamese deaths overall, combatants and non-combatants, right. uh, 2 million of them civilians, uh, 5.3 million civilian wounded using a very uh, conservative method of, of estimation. The U.S. government came up with a number of 11 million Vietnamese who were made refugees during the war. And the latest studies show that um, up to 4 million Vietnamese were exposed to toxic defoliants like Agent Orange. So this is, I mean, it's, it's suffering on, on, a, on a scale that I don't think that most Americans can, can fully wrap their head around. I was struck by your writing that by the mid-60s, the American military had turned war-making 
into a thoroughly, I'm quoting you, thoroughly corporatized, quantitatively oriented system known as techno war. And you say that became in Vietnam the American way of war. And this led to what you call the indiscriminate death of civilians, as well as the atrocities that occurred against individuals. That's right. You know, the, the military fought this war with a, uh, an attrition strategy. Uh, the U.S. was fighting a, a guerrilla war, and, uh, and they were looking for, for a, a metric to show that they were winning. And the attrition strategy provided that by uh, uh, making body count the way that you could tell. Basically, you would kill your way to victory. You would pile up uh, Vietnamese bodies. You would, uh, you would kill more enemy guerrillas than the enemy could put into the field. That was the crossover point. That was the, the famed crossover point. So this crossover point that, that we were supposed to reach when we were killing more Vietnamese than could be replaced led, as you point out here step by step, to the whole notion of the body count as the measure of success in Vietnam. That's right. Uh, sometimes I found that, uh, you know, American troops would take prisoners in the field and they'd call in, you know, I have a prisoner and the commander would call back, well, I want a body count. And then the prisoner would be killed and then called in as, a, as an enemy who was, who was shot while fleeing or shot during a firefight. You say so entire units would be pitted against each other in body count competitions with prizes at stake. Yes, uh, you know, one veteran that I talked to, he said there was a, a great, uh, he called it an incentivization of death. And uh, I, I talked to many veterans who talked about this. They said that, um, you know, that this really messed with their value system, that they were uh, told that, you know, if, if they, they brought in a, a dead Vietnamese, if they proved a body count, they would get three days of R&R &R at a beach resort uh, in Vietnam, or they would get extra beer or light duty when they were back at base camp, or medals, badges. Uh, so there were all these incentives that, uh, that were pushing them to, uh, uh, to, to, to produce bodies. And then there were um, disincentives. There were, uh, along with those carrots, there were sticks. They knew if they didn't uh, produce bodies that they'd, be, uh, that they'd have it tougher. They'd be kept out in the field longer. They wouldn't, they'd have to march out instead of getting a, an airlift and a helicopter. Uh, so. So there were real reasons to produce bodies. You describe, you know, as almost a sporting event, sports statistics, box scores, uh, and those scores being padded by including civilians. Yeah, there were, um, you know, everywhere in Vietnam there were uh, kill boards, they were called up, that, uh, that, that showed each unit's number of kills. Uh, some men talk about it, you know, the, the being like box scores up in the mess hall in military publications. This, uh, this idea of body count was just drilled into them at, at every turn, uh, and they really couldn't get away from it. I mean, this was, this was the way w the war was fought, and it, it turned out to be disastrous for Vietnamese civilians. And so that led, as you say, to the body count as the measure of success. Nick, you, you make it clear that this pressure that led to this kind of killing came down from the top in Washington as well from Secretary of Defense McNamara at the Pentagon and clearly uh, from the White House. I think it did. And there was rarely any distinction made between enemies and the civilian population. Uh, they were, uh, you know, the, the, and I should make the point that these are very young men at the time, uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. So they get to boot camp as, as mere boys and they're really told that all the Vietnamese are dangerous and. Uh, and they learned pretty quickly that it was okay to shoot first because no one was going to ask questions later. How were you affected when you went to Vietnam for the first time? Well, I was, um, it, it really changed, uh, you know, the, the project that I was working on, and, it, and I think it changed me in, in profound ways. I went, so? I went to Vietnam, uh, you know, with these stacks of documents, and I was looking for witnesses and survivors to individual uh, atrocities, the cases that, that I had read about. And, uh, and I, went, I went to these villages and I talked to Vietnamese and I, I, I was asking them about one specific spasm of violence. But what, I, what they kept telling me, the stories that I kept hearing, was what it was like to live for 10 years under bombs and shells and helicopter gunships and how they had to negotiate their lives around the American war. What it was like to have your home burned down five, six, seven times and to finally give up rebuilding it 
and start to live a subterranean or semi-subterranean existence in a bomb shelter and have to, uh, you know, have to uh, make all these calculations about how to survive, when to leave the bomb shelter to forage for food or uh, to, to find water or to relieve yourself, when to farm. Uh, and, and all these decisions could have a profound effect. They, your life depended on it and the life of your family. You had to know to get into the bomb shelter in time when artillery started raining down, but you had to get out of there before the American troops came through and started uh, grenading the bunkers uh, because Americans didn't see these as bomb shelters. They saw them as, as enemy bunkers that, that could have be hiding guerrillas. And the Vietnamese lived with this for, for 10 years straight. And as they told me these stories again and again, I realized that this was really the story that I needed to tell, the one of, of Vietnamese civilian suffering, the one you, of... You call it a system of suffering. Yeah, I, you know, with, with all the, uh, the way that the American war was engineered, I think it, it turned it into a, a veritable system of suffering. Did you encounter animosity and anger toward you as an American? I didn't, and uh, it was one of the, the most shocking things to me. That, uh, you know, I would, I would go into a village and I would often be the first uh, American they'd, they'd seen since the war. And, uh, you know, I'd ask them to dredge up the most, uh, you know, horrific events imaginable, the most horrible days of their lives. And then I'd ask these people to do it again and again to make sure that I got the story exactly right. And afterwards, uh, I would be shocked to find them thanking me, that they would... Uh, they expressed a, a great gratitude. They were amazed that an American knew something of the, the story of what they had lived through, the story of their hamlet. And, and they, they couldn't believe that someone had traveled halfway around the world to, to listen to them. Why are we talking about this? Do we think any good is going to come out of resurrecting the skeletons in the closet and bringing them out and exposing them in your book or in a conversation like this? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that it will have uh, some bearing on the present. You know, the, the U.S. is, of course, involved in uh, has been involved in, in constant warfare in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, Libya, Yemen, Somalia. Uh, there's uh, you know, military interventions taking place all over the world over the last decade plus. But I don't think that Americans uh, really have a, have a clear picture of those wars and, and what they've meant for, for people overseas, what they've meant to civilians around the world. So uh, I hope that, that my book might be able to uh, you know, to, to add to that conversation, to open Americans' eyes to, to what wars mean uh, for, for people overseas. And if we're asked to send our, uh, our brothers and sisters and, and sons and daughters to war, I think uh, we should have some idea of, of what it means for the, uh, the sons and daughters of, of people overseas. The book is Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam. Nick Tersh, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Hardly had Nick Tersh and I finished our conversation than the New York Times published a chilling account of a Muslim cleric in Yemen named Salim Ahmed bin Ali Jaber. He was standing in a village mosque denouncing al-Qaeda, a brave thing to do, a respected tribal figure arguing against terrorism. But two days later, when he and a police officer cousin agreed to meet with three al-Qaeda members to continue the debate, all five men, friend and foe, were incinerated by an American drone attack. The killings infuriated the village and prompted rumors of an upwelling of support in the town for al-Qaeda because, the Times reported, such a move is seen as the only way to retaliate against the United States. Our blind faith in technology, combined with a sense of infallible righteousness, continues unabated. It brought us to grief in Vietnam and Iraq and may do so again with President Obama's cold-blooded use of drones and his seeming indifference to so-called collateral damage, otherwise known as innocent bystanders. By the standards of slaughter in Vietnam, the deaths by drone are hardly a blip on the consciousness of official Washington. But we have to wonder if each one, a young boy gathering wood at dawn, unsuspecting of his imminent annihilation, the student picking up the wrong hitchhikers, that tribal elder standing up against fanatics, doesn't give rise to second thoughts by those judges who prematurely handed our president the Nobel Prize for Peace. 
Better they had kept it on the shelf in hopeful waiting, untarnished. At our website, BillMoyers.com, we've added to our extensive coverage of drone warfare and counterterrorism, including an update from last week's guest, Vicki Duvall, a former legal advisor to the CIA. That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.